Hi, everyone. Welcome to Science Gallery London. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, in-person and live-streamed event tonight. Uh, I'm Jen, I'm Head of Programming at Science Gallery London, and I am here to do the boring housekeeping announcements before handing over to our amazing panel tonight. Um, so first, to, first thing to say is that we, we haven't planned any fire alarms. So if you hear a fire alarm, it means please leave the building through this staircase behind me and head out into the big wide world. Do not uh, return. Um, second thing to say is if you need the loo, the toilets are located at the back of the theater. So head out and take a right. Um, and then I'll just say a bit, has anyone been to Science Gallery London before? Hands up. Yes of you. Um, welcome back. And for those of you who haven't been here before, so we are um, a gallery space. We're part of King's College London. We're a place to grow new ideas across art, science and health. And I don't know if you had a chance to check out the exhibition upstairs before coming into the theatre, but this season uh, we are looking at AI, as it says here. So uh, the title of the season is AI, Who's Looking After Me? And it's really looking at AI uh, through the lens of care. Uh, so we are delving into ethical questions through our exhibition and our ongoing event program. We are kind of uh, bringing together artists, designers, researchers, ethicists, people like yourselves. We really want uh, to include everyone's perspectives on something that is happening at speed and scale in our society right now. Um, and there's, so there's a sense of urgency to the kind of questions that we're asking and yeah, really interested to kind of hear what you guys think as well. So I'm going to introduce Denny Newman Griffiths, who is a lecturer in data science at the University of Sheffield. He is the chair of the discussion tonight, and I'm going to hand over to him now, and um, he will introduce the rest of the panel. All right, thank you very much. So I am, excellent, there we go. So I'm very excited to be here. I'm uh, excited to be, uh, have the privilege of chairing this excellent panel of really interesting people who are frankly more interesting than I am. And uh, leading a discussion on something that's really quite important and something that's, that's personally important to each of us, um, I suspect personally important to many of you, and certainly an important discussion that we need to be having in the world of the moment. Um, a couple of housekeeping things from me before we get going. Uh, because this is a relatively, well, the, uh, in there are aspects of this topic, aspects of healthcare bias, aspects of AI bias that touch on sensitive topics. Um, we'll just ask you to please be cognizant of the fact that we may be talking about some things that are difficult. Please do be sensitive and respectful and supportive of the people around you and, of the pe and respect the people who are on the stage. Well, stage in the sense of we're down here and you're, you're all up there. Um, the other thing to note is that this really is a collaborative discussion. So we're thinking about you know, the, the, this landscape of AI, equity, and healthcare is one that has been changing rapidly, and it's one that will continue to change rapidly. So this is not a discussion where we're going to solve all the issues now. This is not a discussion where we're going to map exactly what things are looking like. This will be an evolving topic, and what we are, how we are wanting to approach this discussion and approach it with you is as a collaborative effort. So that's the, the sort of position that we're trying to bring to this. Um, so I will give a brief introduction to myself and then ask the other members of the panel to introduce themselves. Uh, as Jen said, my name is Denny Newman-Griffiths. I am a genderqueer and neurodivergent researcher at the University of Sheffield. Um, I use they, them pronouns, and I work on responsible AI from a sort of practice-oriented perspective, so thinking about how we work with AI technologies, uh, what, what that looks like from a management and practice standpoint. And I study uh, the intersection of AI and disability, how disability is represented in data and how we work with that from an AI perspective. So I'll now ask the other panelists to please give a brief introduction of yourself, a little bit about what you do and uh, sort of relevant interests that have brought you to the panel. And Lex, you are next to me, so I'll ask you to go first. Um, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Lex Vefega, um, co-founder and design principal at a creative technology um, studio called Kamuzi. Um, I've been exploring the world of machine learning or artificial intelligence for a long time. First looking at, you know, bias in data sets and that looking at that in society all the way to looking at AI and creativity. Um, I formerly was a lecturer on um, the diploma programme at University of Arts London's Creative Computing Institute where I taught a module for a couple of years called Comput Computational Futures and Artificial Intelligence 
where I introduced students to pre-trained machine learning models. And obviously being in an art school context, getting them to express themselves creatively, but also having this critical um, side of things. My whole thing was always about, okay, here's a computer vision model. Let's see how we could visualize ourselves as clowns through a camera, but also for fun and, exp and, and, and for a laughter purpose, but also getting my class to think about the same computer vision model could be used to police me if I walk into the shop the next day. And having that juxtaposition and that contrast, just being able, I think for me, I always sit in the middle where I'm, machine learning can help things, but also there is ethical implications about the technology that we need to address. So that is me. Hopefully, I'll be insightful to this panel um, this evening. Brilliant, thank you. We're, we're very glad to have you and very glad to have all of our panelists. Thanks, Lex. Can I hand over to you, Tiana? Yeah, so um, my name's Tiana Lee. Um, I'm a PhD student here at King's College, London. Um, my PhD is looking at fairness and bias in AI that's used for cardiac imaging. So right now I'm looking at how um, the imbalances in data sets can cause uh, models to produce biased or perhaps not biased results. Um, and I would say I don't have as much experience so far as these two. Um, I'm kind of new in the journey, but uh, one thing I have realized is that in my department, and kind of in the world of uh, machine learning, deep learning, AI, is that we're a bit slow to catch up on like ethics. Um, so I have kind of become the nominated ethics person in my department and have had to do a lot of teaching about bias, fairness, and ethics. Um, and so that's why I'm here, and I hope I can be a valuable panel member too. Excellent, thank you very much, Tiana. And we have joining us virtually from across the pond, a uh, very wonderful Additional guest, uh, Leo Celli. Leo, could you please give, your, uh, give us an introduction? Hello, greetings from the fake Cambridge, uh, where I'm um, <laughs> calling from. Uh, I'm at MIT right now. I am a medical doctor. I work in the intensive care unit at one of the hospitals here in Boston, but research is based here at MIT, and the focus is on building capacity in data science and artificial intelligence as applied to healthcare. And I think this is a eureka year for us where we realize that we have been doing it wrong, how, how to uh, build machine learning models to improve uh, clinical outcomes. In the past, what we have taught our students is that you optimize a function and for the most part, it is a, uh, an accuracy function based on prediction or optimization and we evaluate it against real world data. And we realize that this is the perfect setup for permanently ingraining all the inequities that we're seeing, uh, which is represented in the data to become permanent fixtures in society. So AI coding oppression, AI coding disparities. So with that, we've decided that we should spend more time in understanding the data first before you build any models. So we need to understand what we refer to as the social patterning of the data generation process. We need to understand the ecosystem that produces the data. And that is something that we have not emphasized in the past. And that is something too that is much more difficult than just throwing as much data as you can into an encoder or a transformer and see what sticks. Uh, that's the lazy way to do it. And it's full of risk of preventing or full of risk of doing more harm than good. Uh, what I'd like to say is that AI should not replace a bad system with an even worse system because now all the problems that we're seeing are permanently encrypted in the way we deliver care. So looking forward to this discussion. Brilliant, thank you very much, Leo. And uh, I think we're all, we're all looking forward to, to this. So just a, a note on how this will run. Um, we have a, a set of a kind of set of aspects of this topic that we want to um, talk through. This is mostly my privilege as chair as I get to prompt these awesome people to respond to particular aspects of this discussion. Uh, we will also be asking for uh, and open to questions and input from you. So um, uh, those of you who are on the Zoom, you're able to enter questions through the Zoom chat. Those who are in person, we will have some roving mics and we'll, we'll kind of start that process a little bit uh, later into the session. What I'm going to do to start uh, is I wanna set the stage a little bit for what we're talking about. So we have 
you know, the, the, the title of the session is, is talking about AI equity in healthcare. There's a lot of conversation that's going on about these topics, uh, not necessarily all three of them at the same time, but certainly AI in equity, AI in healthcare, equity in healthcare, these are all things that there's a lot of discussion about. But we know that that discussion can always be improved and often it's the things that aren't being talked about that are the most important things to start addressing. So what I'd like to do now is I've asked each of our panelists to prepare about a two minute provocation on this theme of what is missing from the discussion that we're having right now about AI equity and healthcare. And Lex, I'm going to go to you first again, since you're unfortunately stuck next to me. They ganged up for me and made me sit in the middle before this panel was started. Um, okay, cool. I guess my provocation is, as somebody who is hired most of the time to make sense of the um, emerging technologies, I think I very have an anti-technology approach to things. My whole stance a lot with AI is that it just makes our human bad decisions faster. And sometimes I ask and say, is this innovation for innovation's sake? What is, you know, there is obviously clear evidence of where machine learning could possibly support and help people, but how, you know, it goes back to um, Leo's point about, you know, you've already got a bad system, why replace it with an even worse system? You know, and it's, and I think it's sometimes you, when it comes, especially as I, I see it a lot with healthcare, you've got folks who don't understand the, the healthcare is a very complex in, in, in industry vertical, would I say? And folks would be like, okay, I can build this sophisticated tool that can do this and enter, and here's the solution, but realize it doesn't work that well. And I think for me, I always ask, like, why are we doing this? Like, I think that's the my whole provocation today is why, like, why? do these things if we know that the performance isn't at this point that great. We're, I'm putting it in a very commercial setting. Why? Why should we? I think that's my provocation to my fellow panelists and to everybody in the audience today is why should we? Why should we use AI in healthcare? What, what is the point of it? Honestly, you may have just sorted the panel for us. Uh, I think we, we can all just go have a drink now. <laughs> no, th thank you very much for that. And, and I think there's a lot of themes in there that we'll be coming back to throughout the discussion. Um, Tiana, let me hand it over to you now. Um, so not to make us as a whole sound like petulant children, but um, my kind of question would be not just why, but who are we doing this for? Um, because I think often as a researcher, we see things on paper and we're always optimizing and trying to get the best numbers and sometimes it goes to publication and no one except other researchers read this. Um, and the end goal is actually for it to be deployed in clinics. And that's, there's sometimes a, a big gap between what researchers think and what clinicians and patients think. Um, and so when we're thinking of fairness, we're thinking in, in numbers and, and efficiencies and kind of making things even, but it's actual patient care that we need to be thinking of, which is sometimes missing from research. So um, I think in kind of the whole discussion of bias, fairness, um, and equity, who are we doing this for? Is, is it for researchers to say they've got the best numbers, or is it really for patients, who it should be, um, to say that they're getting actually the best treatment? Brilliant, thank you. So then, Leo, let me hand it over to you. I mean, I'm going to build up on what my co-panelists um, started talking about. And it's really who is missing in this discussion. And that's really the voice of the patients and the caregivers. Uh, historically, at the forefront of innovation are people in academic institutions, people who occupy very privileged positions in society. And they think that they know what's best for everyone else. And we, we have a we have an acronym for that. We call it AI, arrogant and ignorant. Just because we wrote the books doesn't mean that we understand the problem well. And for the longest time up until now, as I said, we minimize the voice of the patients and their caregivers. We include them in the trials, but we didn't really engage them in trying to um, solicit what are the biggest problems. Uh, Typically, we talk to them for a few hours during the design thinking process, but it's a very limited uh, contribution. And I think that we should really be investing in making sure that um, there are more researchers representing uh, 
patient perspectives, caregiver perspectives, and not just use them to bounce off our ideas. So to me, the biggest barrier that we see in terms of AI really being woven into every fabric of society is the lack of education and training around AI. So most of the problems that we're seeing, so industry taking the helm of the AI revolution, uh, clinician and patients not having enough say on the trajectory of the field, that's because most of us are not really, to a certain degree, ignorant. We don't know what it's about. We don't know what are the capabilities. We don't know what are the limitations and the dangers and the risks. So everyone else is a bystander and we're waiting for someone else to make the decisions for us. And unfortunately, as you've heard before, if you're not sitting at the table, you're probably at the menu. Someone is taking advantage of you. So unless we understand to a certain degree what data science is all about, then people are going to continue using that to make profit, to make revenues, to get something out of us. So to me, most of our investment should be teaching grade school students, high school students, teaching them data science at the very start. Because as we have seen during the pandemic, misinformation and misinformation will kill people. And I think that's because we are to a certain degree data illiterate, data science illiterate. And we need to address that if we're truly going to harness the power of this technology because they are very powerful. But what they will do is, as I mentioned earlier, they will fix everything that we see now as permanent uh, part of our society. And we don't want that to happen because what we have now is far from the world that we would like to have. Brilliant, thank you very much, Leo. And I, I will say that we will talk about some of the positive aspects of this as well. So there is, you know, we, we are, I think it's fair to say we're coming from a place of love with this. The reason that we're focusing on the things that we're talking about in this discussion is because we see them as barriers to achieving the kinds of goods, good that we can do with better approaches to AI. So that's something that we'll be returning to throughout the discussion. So we've highlighted questions of why do this, who are we doing this for, who is missing from the discussion. What, I'll, what I will add to this is what information are we missing from the discussion? So as I mentioned, I study uh, AI and disability, so thinking about the ways that disability is represented in data or often not represented in data, and how AI systems and AI practitioners interact with that. And one of the things that becomes very clear in that space is that what's really important, frankly, about the lived experience of health in general is what your experience is, how you're living your life, the things that you do in, a, in the day, the things that you really care about, and that health issues or uh, disability or other things are interfering with. That information, we're not really working with. We're not really collecting it, and we're not really putting it in front of the people who need to be using that data, the people who need to be using that information and working with it to improve health and well-being. So where I see a great deal of potential for bringing AI to the table, and a great deal of risk if it's done inappropriately, is in being able to bring in more of that kind of data about what matters to people, what matters from people's experiences, and making that data, making that information available and accessible and usable for more team-based healthcare. So that's my provocation to kind of round out our themes. So with that, I'd like to do sort of maybe step back a little bit and say, you know, we've been throwing around AI in healthcare, um, but it's not necessarily clear what that means. So when we talk about AI in healthcare, what does that look like? And what kinds of technology, what kinds of applications are we actually talking about here? And Leo, I'm, I'd like to start with you on this because I know that in your position, you're working with a lot of different kinds of applications of AI. Of course, um, I think the one that has been at the forefront of uh, all the newspapers, uh, newspaper articles are large language models. So large language models are, um, an algorithm that would determine 
the relationship of different bits of text based on uh, training the algorithm on billions of digitized content from the internet. And by using a transformer model that was introduced in 2016, you start understanding what words belong together. And it's been used for uh, chatbots like ChatGPT. And as we speak, we know that this is already being used by patients and by providers. Um, they're typing in their symptoms. They're typing in what sort of tests should I be, uh, should I be uh, obtained or, or taken from me. Um, but we need to understand that the vast majority, if not all of the digitized content that is available on the internet uh, that was used to train these models are coming from Western countries, are coming from rich institutions, are coming from investigators and bloggers who have the loudest voice. So the opportunity for these types of um, algorithms to help when it comes to decision making, when it comes to diagnosis, um, there is the risk of augmenting whatever bias is found in this data. And I'm going to give you a very concrete example where our group uh, asked GPT-4, which is a large language model, to provide us with some possible diagnosis given a description of a patient. And we use uh, case vignettes coming from the New England Journal of Medicine. So these are well curated um, description of a patient. And what we did was we used exactly the same description of the case but each time we were changing the race, ethnicity, and also the sex of the patient. For example, we gave it a case of someone with shortness of breath who happens to have a blood clot in the lung. And what we observe is that if the patient were a woman, um, the large language model would say that there is a likelihood that this is a panic attack or an anxiety disorder. And it's always much higher uh, compared to when the patient is a man, even though we were giving it exactly the same information. Uh, when we gave it a case of a college student with sore throat, if the college student were a black male, um, the large language model would suggest that this could be a sexually transmitted infection. So based alone on the race, ethnicity, and, and the sex, it makes assumptions about the behavior. And this is the, the, the real danger is that all the harmful associations that we have learned are megaphoned, augmented by this large language model because they are oversampled in the internet, on Reddit and on, on Twitter. And it's going to pick it up. So they're, they're going to learn, these large language models are going to learn this biases that we have. And a lot of them are subtle biases. And I wanted to point that out because the way that large language models are making sure that it does not accept uh, overtly racist or sexist prompts and it does not give overtly racist, sexist, ableist uh, output is by um using humans to filter them. But I would argue that a lot of these um, biases are very subtle and humans will not be able to detect them and filter them out. There's a circular fallacy logic that the same humans who are biased, who produce the data, will be able to detect it and remove it. Um, we say that when we do this, so we call this reinforcement learning from human feedback, where after you train the model, you fine tune it and you ask humans to make sure that it doesn't deliver um, output that should not be given. Um, we think that it is too late to do this at the very end when a model is almost completely developed. We need to work on the data sets themselves. Uh, we have likened this approach of having humans in the loop at the tail end of the modeling as it's akin to raising your kid to be se sexist and racist and ableist. And then as an adult, you tell your kid, you have to undergo cultural sensitivity awareness uh, training. It's too late. The kid is already racist and sexist because the kid was trained on that kind of data. So somehow we need to overhaul the way we're developing the models because we could see 
the the danger, the harm. And I, I wanted to finish off that study that we uh, published this past summer, where we were asking it, what should be the workup of this particular patient if this patient were to present in the emergency department? And what we found is that across the board, if the patient were Black, the large language model is less likely to suggest a CAT scan or a, an imaging uh, test. It's less likely to refer you to a specialist. Again, it learns that association that Black patients could be malingering. They are just there in the emergency department because they're asking for narcotic drugs. So, and, and this is very alarming because we were giving it exactly the same case, but all we're doing is we're changing the race, ethnicity, or the sex of the patient, and then suddenly it changes the recommendation. So these are very real harm that's probably happening now because there is no regulation uh, on the use of large language models. And we've heard that uh, electronic health record vendors are already putting large language models in within their system so that providers can start using them to uh, put together a letter um, uh, requesting for a certain treatment. They might sound like they are mindless tasks and there's no opportunity for bias, but every task that we delegate to large language model is an opportunity for bias to set in. Thanks, Leo. So definitely the themes of what bias looks like and some of these, these questions of kind of how do we start to build strategies around that, those are things that, that we'll be coming back to. I, I do want to uh, sort of loop back a little bit on, on some other examples of what this looks like in practice. So I know, Tiana, this, you're using some other kinds of applications of, of AI in your work. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Yeah, so um, AI is also used in things like radiology. Um, so especially in the NHS, as we know, kind of strapped for cash. Um, and one of the issues is that um, clinicians have too much work to do and not enough time. Um, so one of these things, like radiology, I work with cardiac images, so I'll give you that example. I don't know how many of you have seen an MRI scan, but if you just imagine your organs in your body, um, what a radiologist would do is they would look at the heart and they would try and draw around different regions of the heart. And this is because in each frame of that MRI image, um, you can measure, for example, how much blood is being pumped, how quickly, um, what fraction of it is left in the heart between each pump. Um, and so that's how um, the doctor would kind of measure your cardiac function and be able to tell like, how, how well your heart's beating. Um, so a radiologist would have to go through, the gold standard is to go through and kind of draw around each of these regions, which as you can imagine, is a very time consuming thing. Um, there, are, there is software uh, to do it automatically, it's not very good. Um, so radiologists often have to go back and correct it. And so now we have um, AI models that can do it automatically. <clears throat> One of the things I've been looking at in my research is how imbalances in training data that's used to build these models can produce predictions that are less accurate for people who are underrepresented in that data set. And kind of unsurprisingly, if you have a training data set that's very imbalanced, so for example, if it's 100% white patients, you're gonna have a model that works pretty well for white patients and not well for everyone else. Um, and so kind of the conclusion of that is the more diverse your training data set is, the better it works for everyone. Um, so that's one of the applications that I've been looking at, radiology in general. Right, thank you. And Lex, I know you've worked with a lot of different kinds of AI in, in your work, uh, some in, you know, it's in the healthcare setting and in other settings. Are there other examples that, that you'd like to highlight so we can get a better sense of what this can look like in practice? I guess I, I come from a perspective of the, the development side. Once mm -hmm. upon a time, you would have to, you might have a pre-trained model, which is a model that's already trained, similar to what you have now. And then you would try to create your own data set as much as you can to try to feed that into a model. But even as a developer, myself, who develops these apps, it's very hard and very, like, a long process to get this stuff done. So now when you have these sort of off-the-shelf models where you can embed that into your products and service very easily by a couple lines of code, you could, you know, if I wanted to use GPT 3.5 or GPT 4, the, the models that power these, these um, large language models that you interact with with ChatGPT, it's very simple for me to do that with a simple lines of code, here you go, and I can give it a function, act as a medical doctor, and when somebody gives you a symptom, answer these particular questions. 
One of my biggest worries a lot when working in this space, especially when I know what I know about the particular biases that comes, and obviously being a black developer, I'm aware of these particular biases. Like when Leo is mentioning things about, you know, going to a doctor and, you know, the doctor, you know, I mean, going to chat into ChatGPT, using them scenarios of the black person. I can say I've had those moments in real life. You know what I mean? That's a real life experience. So when we're looking at it into healthcare, one of the things which I'm constantly trying to figure out is, I understand the beautiful potential of these technologies, but I need to limit the scope. So what could it be used for? So I'll give a quick example. So last week or two weeks ago, I spoke to my physio. Um, he's a, one of the renowned in the world around like spines, because I hurt my spine in the gym. And he said to me that, and he's written a bunch of books, and he said to me that a, b a bunch of guys who wanted to build this AI app had given him a ring and they were like, we want to take everything you've written in these books and we want to train, we want to train this model on your books and we're going to create this AI app that can self-diagnose people's back issues. And, he, and this is somebody who doesn't know anything about AI or machine learning. They work with athletes all day long to get them better. That's all he knows. And so he's asking me, Lex, I know you work with this, break this down for me. And I'm like, you know the process of back issues. You can't self, no machine learning um, model would be able to diagnose a back issue because that's a human thing. You need to see them in person. You need to see how they walk. You need to feel particular parts. There's also that intuition from that human experience. And what I had to say to him was like, this self-diagnosis part, probably not. Maybe where machine learning or this AI model could support you and help you, it's on those very small tasks. Like once you've, you've done this whole person, process in person, where you've helped self-diagnose this person with their issue and they're on their journey already, you've solved that particular problem. Maybe it's you have, maybe someone emails you or WhatsApps you at night, asks you these particular questions or these particular stuff. Maybe at this point, this is where machine learning could necessarily play a supporting role. It could, rep it could replace that, maybe that conversational aspect of who you are. But the diagnosis aspect, hell no. I would never trust that. But that also leads to that whole point sometimes when I'm like, at this point for a patient experience, is that enough? And it's that constant debate as somebody who works, you know, develops apps or does a lot of work in healthcare, and everybody's talking about AI, it's a new thing, we need to put AI here, we need to put AI in this place. Like how, what is the value in when you know that you putting it in an uncontrolled environment is pretty risky, and where is the value for the patient in that aspect there? So that's something that um, in my day-to-day -day work is what I think about a lot. I really love that, that question of is this particular thing that you're trying to do, like can you break it down into maybe portions where it makes a little bit more sense to bring AI to bear? I think that's, that's such a powerful way to look at it. And to start to, to push back on this narrative of we have to do everything with AI. Well, we don't have to do everything with AI and, and sometimes it's not the right thing, you know, it's not the right tool to use. Just from the purposes of what you want to do, it's not the right tool. So being able to get to this point of saying when it is the right tool, when it is not the right tool is a really important part of the discussions I think that we need to be having. So let's, with some of these examples of AI use and AI applications in mind, and, and I can add in uh, you know, applications around like analyzing the, the clinical notes that are written during encounters and being able to identify these are the kinds of symptoms and the procedures and, and so on that, that are mentioned in there. So you can get a little bit richer analysis of health data. You know, thinking about these, these wide variety of different things, obviously we talk a lot about bias. And Leo's already brought up a, a number of really, really good examples of what that bias can look like, how we can start to get at it from a systematic perspective. What I want to, to ask the panel about is, you know, we talk a lot about measuring bias and we talk about debiasing systems. We don't really have a good definition for what that means but we certainly talk about it. So what does a, a fairer approach, what does a less biased approach to AI look like, less from a measurement perspective and more from a human and patient experience perspective to you? And Tiana, I wanna start with you on this because this is your research area. So 
from, I'll tell you a story. Um, so when I was about, I don't remember it, but when I was about four, we'll say, um, I had um, chicken pox. And like we, my mum called 111 and they kept telling her it's fine, she'll get over it. My mum said, oh, but she, you know, she's in a lot of pain. Um, you know, I, I think she should see a doctor. And so we lived in an area that at the time had quite a good GP. So we managed to go to the GP and she's like, oh yeah, she's definitely got chicken pox and I'll give her some cream and like this will make her feel better. By the way, a lot of my medical students have never actually seen a black child with chicken pox. So can we use her as an example? And so I got used as a medical example of what chicken pox looked like because at the time, there were just no pictures in medical textbooks of non-white people with skin conditions. And this is a big problem in like dermatology. And I imagine it's a big problem in lots of other fields as well. So I think on a patient level, fairness looks like being able to go to your GP, your doctor, your surgeon, and know that they know what your condition looks like in you and being able to trust that they actually have the knowledge, not because they're a, a bad doctor, but because they haven't been given the tools to uh, kind of apply the best medicine to you because medicine doesn't look the same in every person. Um, as you can tell by like dermatology, skin conditions look different in different people. Um, so I think on a, on a personal level, I think that's, that's what it would look like to patients. Um, from a researcher perspective, how to apply research to get that goal. Um, I think as, I can't remember whether it was Lex Leo who said it, um, but there needs to be more input from both patients and clinicians in research. Because sometimes we develop things and we think, oh yeah, this is great. And then you give it to a doctor and they're like, what am I gonna do with this? Like, this is useless. Mm. Um, so I think there needs to be a lot more communication um, for both patients and doctors to have an input on, well, this is what is going to be useful for us and this is what's actually going to improve patient care rather than just improving numbers, which doesn't always actually translate to improved outcomes for patients or what a patient would actually want. Brilliant, thank you. Lux, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I think for me, coming from that perspective as being, you know, I'm going to take these machine learning models and integrate that into a product or service, I think one of the hardest, what is fairness, I guess it goes back to the data set itself. I think it's a very hard situation, this conversation about, I, I remember talk, I've been talking about bias in AI systems since 2017, 2018, and the questions at that time was, how do we de-bias the AI system? And I'm like, bro, I don't know, human beings are biased, you get me? Like, I could, I could create something about the science gallery and say, here's my AI tool that you can interact with it and it gives you knowledge on the science gallery. But I was the one who created that data set. So that's my own bias involved. I've picked what I think everybody in this room would like. That's how simple it is. I always try to use that example of like, that's how simple it is to create these things. And it's like, okay, how do we have a multitude of perspectives? I think that's a key thing, right? A multitude of perspectives where, um, where we can talk about that. But there's also this thing that Leo mentioned about the fallacy, right? Would human beings be able to really identify bias in an actual data set? So it's just weird, like, confusion. And that's why I say a lot of the times for me, as my approach to being responsible with machine learning is to try to limit as much, like, you, I'm, I believe in the technology, but I try to limit, I try to limit the scope of what the technology could necessarily do in a particular use case to avoid that weird sort of moments. Like, you know, I don't know if any of you have used Midjourney to create images before, but I, I gave a talk recently to designers in the home office who were interested in using AI in their workflow. And I showed two different examples, and it was man and woman sitting on a bench, romantic, cinematic shot. And it was lovely. It was, you know, a lovely white couple sitting on, on, on the bench in New York, I think New York. Um, then I wrote, man and woman sitting on a bench, and what I put in the sort of technical description was hip-hop and the rest. And you, you know what happened, it had like a black guy and a white woman and sitting on his bench. And that was an interesting thing because it was like, I didn't specify. A, you know, there is always a default in a data set. That's a particular, you know, that's, you know. B, when I now put this particular term, 
it gave me a particular, it, 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 you know, I put hip hop in and it quickly associated that with black. You know what I mean? Someone from the data scientist or someone from the labeling side of that data had done that association. But I can say N NNM is a really good hip hop rapper. Why didn't it give me somebody that looks like NNM? This is just those type of like, you know, you know, it's something to play around and be funny with, but it's just those little moments where, you know, which if you put that in a different context or a different scenario, it could possibly be more harmful than just that really, you know, playful sort of artistic experiment that I was playing around with. So I think for me, I'm always like, fairness for me looks like, can I trust the model I work with to put it in an environment in an uncontrolled way? I think that's that thing for me, it's really about uncontrolled environments where the edge cases, you're not there to see it, you can't control it, you can't test it, you can't fix it. That's somebody who's using your product, your service or your model in the comforts of their own environment. How do you mitigate for those particular things? Thanks very much. And yeah, I think the, the, the uncontrolled environment is something that we don't, we, it doesn't often enter into this sort of AI evaluation process. And I think that, that highlights really good, or that it very effectively highlights the need for, for doing that a bit more. Leo, I do want to come back to you. You, you, you know, gave us some great examples of this uh, earlier, but do you want to uh, add anything on this idea of more, sort of a bit more of a human face of what fair, fair and equitable AI looks like for you? Yes, no, I, I want to start by saying that I, I don't think that we don't need AI because we do need AI. There are so many problems that need fixing right now where data science and artificial intelligence can play a huge role. And one of them was highlighted by Tierna. Our understanding of health and disease is primarily through the lenses of someone taking care of a white patient. Our description of Alzheimer's disease, primarily observations of white people in the United States, in the UK, that have Alzheimer's, even though the statistics show that minority patients are twice more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease during their lifetime. And this needs to change because everything that we do is informed by research that is performed in rich countries that are well-funded. And no one has pictures of chicken pox in a black kid. No one has pictures of uh, some other disease in a patient in Asia or in Africa where they actually bear the bigger burden of, of, of diseases and disasters. So somehow there's a need to overhaul the medical knowledge system that informs us how do we detect disease? How do we diagnose? How do we prevent? And there is potential uh, contribution that we could get from the digitized capture of the care that patients are getting. So tremendous opportunity, but it could be completely wasted if we don't do it right. Mm. When it comes to fairness, what does it look like? My answer, my first answer to that is who are we to define fairness? We are all very privileged individuals. And here we are defining fairness for the rest of the world. That does not make sense to me. But I think in the long run, the, the, the only definition of fairness or model performance that matters is the one that matters to patients. So in the, in the long run, we don't care about the accuracy. We don't care about the AU ROC or the AU PRC of a model. What we care about is did it improve outcomes, especially among those who are left behind by all the innovations in healthcare. So in the end, um, the model performance, it's, it's a surrogate and it's easy because the machine learning people can easily calculate the, the accuracy and the false positive and the false negative. But in the end, those numbers don't matter. What matters is, are we saving more lives as a result of this algorithm? So our group had advanced or had proposed this dashboard where there's real time monitoring of who is dying from what, how long are they spending in the hospital? Uh, and this should be disaggregated according to different groups with a special focus on those who are marginalized. 
we have to be careful because this could lead to more stigma by focusing more on on these patients that um, that have already been uh, disenfranchised by the the health system. But as I said, to me, the goal of machine learning community should not be a highly accurate algorithm. The it, it boils down the question. What is the goal of AI? The goal of AI is not to produce accurate models. The goal of AI is to improve the lives of people. And that cannot be measured with the metrics, the fairness metrics that we have now. Because at present, all we're doing is, does it perform consistently across groups of people? And if the answer is yes, it means that it will continue to predict poor outcomes for some people. And of course, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're not going to do well. We're not going to treat you anyway. So um, I don't have the fixes right now. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing all these questions because I'm hoping to uh, recruit people who would join our journey to try to answer these questions, because these are the most important questions for, for the machine learning community. It's not about, let's just try to come up with ethically sourced data set that represents everyone, uh, buy more computational uh, resources to allow us to build this powerful transform transformer model. Uh, it's really, how do we create a system where the technology and the people using them coexist in an ideal way? Because people are looking at AI as separate as a technology that is in a vacuum, when in fact, it should fit a role there in society. And that's what we need to design. What is the ideal human AI e interface and ecosystem where we're able to derive value from this very powerful technology? Absolutely, thank you. And, and I wanna, I, I first wanna amplify what you said about we're not solving this now. <laughs> um, that would be lovely, but we're not going to do that in, you know, in an hour and a half discussion. We're not going to do that this year. But this is a journey that we, are, that we are all on together, and we definitely want your input. We want your involvement in that process, and that is a really important part of this. I want to stick with this idea of really thinking about how are we delivering value for the patient? How are we making a positive difference in people's lives? And come to this question that, that, that comes up sometimes about are there situations where we just should not be using AI? If, if we say what we're wanting to do is not a question of machine performance, it's not a question of uh, decision efficiency improvement or what have you, but it's a question of how do we make a positive difference in people's lives. Are there aspects of healthcare where we just should not be using AI? Or are there perhaps ways of using AI that we should be avoiding? And Lex, I'm going to come to you first because you, you I, I wanted to pick up on the idea that you put so well earlier of innovation for innovation's sake. And you were highlighting already some of, the, some of the aspects of kind of breaking things down. So I'm going to, I guess, poke you a little bit to, to, to dig deeper into that and, and start to say, you know, where, where can we start to say this, this kind of application of AI just doesn't make sense for a human-centered goal? Um. It's, a, it's something I'm thinking about right now because, you know, when I began to look at more AI in healthcare, the first area I was looking at was mental health chatbots. And so at the time, we were looking at the rise of Wobot, Whisker. I think there was one called Replica. Replica has evolved into its own different <clears throat> weird chatbot right now. But at first, it was very much like around mental health. Now it's doing some weird, some weird stuff like, like, I'm your AI partner. It's, it's, but a lot of the times it was these things of these interactions, right? Where we were looking, I guess, at this project. I worked with a couple organization called Projects by IF, and they had done some bunch of research with the London School of Economics around how do you explain automated decisions? You know, and at the time, you know, we used a lot when we talked about algorithms, it was always this aspect of the black box, right? But we were trying to find ways on how we could design interaction patterns that would show this human being interacting with this chatbot, how the chatbot was able to perhaps suggest things on your behalf. And so, because what was happening is there was this increase of, you know, um, people conversating with these chatbots, but almost 
And we also have this thing which we associate AI with this godlike energy sometimes, where it's like, I have this AI chatbot, it's mine, it's, but really and truly you're talking to an interface, a, a sort of rap, uh, chat layer, layer wrapper, and the data's, there's a whole bunch of hundreds of people who, take, who, who have access to your data and you have this conversation with them on a regular basis. And we were trying to find ways on how could we, if we had this dream mental health chatbot, how could we basically present that to the rest of the community and be like, this is how interaction should be. So we created this mental health chatbot called Muja. And some of the things we would do is like, Muja does not refer to itself as I, it would refer to itself as this is Muja. Muja achieves this particular purpose. When you would have a conversation with Muja, Muja would basically always replicate back to you what you said. And then you would have to confirm that process. And so Muja would constantly say, because you said this, this is how we're going to, we will make these recommendations because of these things. Mm -hmm. And it was trying to find this particular interface between, you know, human and AI. I think there was a lot of value from, which was already seen from like some of the early AI researchers when they created the first AI psychotherapist called Eliza in like the 1960s. And there was a lot of studies that showed, or the studies at the time showed that people grew this deeper connection and it has these things. But it's also always about like, how do we do these things in a responsible way? So I think it, it's a spectrum, right? I think if someone said to me, hey, Alex, you use a computer vision model to maybe look at skincare, maybe that's somewhere that I feel, I feel like that's really helpful, especially China's example about the lack of imaging or with black skin with particular skin conditions. That's an interesting area. That's an area of maybe the harm levels, hopefully, is less. Where maybe if it comes to, you know, you have the software that you mentioned as well, the radiology, radio, I don't even know the, the title, radio, 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 radiology. Radiology, not the person that does the, check this. Radiologist. Radiologist, sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not, I don't know the title, but basically that. I would be very scared to like maybe put something in that way or I would be very careful about how I communicate about that technology. I'd be like, we believe it has a potential, but the potential's not right away. And sometimes in the tech world, we tend to overhype these technologies and then sometimes under deliver. And I'm also very interested once this sort of hype dies down of what we have there with the generative AI hype, that's where we might see a lot more productive use cases in that case. But I think for me, it's always about, mm. you're constantly balancing what are the, what are the consequences? What are, it's a spectrum. What's the more safer places to integrate AI into? And where is a bit more of the riskier places where you kind of go, uh, let's still keep it in beta or something mm. for a period of time until we can see it truly improves health outcomes, or it also improves clinicians' outcomes as well. Because we can talk about patients, but sometimes you add these technologies. And then it's like, when you, I don't know if any of you use ChatGPT to do anything writing for you where you have to go back and edit it back after, you know? But if you're in a clinician who's overworked, underpaid, stressed out, and I introduce this new tool, which makes you do more work after, it ain't really working. So it's not as like black or white. I think it's a spectrum and there's a, yeah, it's still a long way to go. We're still at the early stages of, of these, of, yeah, of utilizing these tools in this way. Absolutely. So let me take the question to you then, Tiana. Is, what does that process of balancing, kind of balancing all these different concerns look like for you in terms of what we should or should not be doing? Yeah, so I, I absolutely love your phrase, innovation for innovation's sake. Um, because I think, you know, if we're talking about iPhones and computers and TVs, that's all well and good, and everyone can go and treat themselves to a new phone. But in healthcare, it is quite literally life and death. And there was a, a news story a few weeks ago, I don't know if you saw it, about how um, it was talking about liver transplants. And there was an algorithm that was used um, in the NHS to try and pr prioritize who's getting liver transplants. Because as you know, there's more demand than supply, as you can expect, of organs. And they used 21 different parameters. They used sex. They used um, kind of where you were, how close you were to the organs, um, the kind of progression of your disease. And as it turned out, one of the most important parameters they used was age. Because the theory was that the older you are, the more kind of in desperate need you are of that liver. 
the problem was that it meant that anyone under a certain age, essentially all young people, were just immediately discounted because you're not old enough and, or in desperate enough need to get the transplant, um, which meant that like young people who had been born with liver problems were kind of bottom of the pile. And I think in situations like this, if you'd given it to any clinician, they would have either factored it in where it was relevant or not factored it in um, and kind of not looked at age as the be all and end all as one of the most important parameters, but instead looked at the person's condition. Um, but in kind of our efforts to automate and speed up the process of these transplants, we've actually made care worse for a whole group of people. So I think the issue is knowing when automation and AI is actually going to help patients. And you know, it's things save time, they save money, and that's great on paper. Um, but does it actually help people in the end? Um, and I think that's one of the, the hardest things to um, kind of establish. And unfortunately, it seems to be that they only find out once it's already been deployed and already in practice, um, because apparently this wasn't tested before they actually released it um, to the NHS. So I guess it's, I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you're, ra you're raising questions, which is it, honestly, in some ways, more, even more important. So Leo, then let me, let me turn it to you. Thinking about you know, some of the examples that you've seen, thinking about um, you know, situations where bringing AI in is sort of motivated to, to address these goals or motivated to address these challenges that we see, but it ends up, it ends up you know, turning everything pear-shaped. Do you see situations or do you see approaches that people take to trying to, to, trying to integrate AI into a, a, a scenario where it really makes a difference between this is going to be helpful or this is going to be harmful? I think the ones where it's really going to be helpful are also at highest risk of, mm. of more harm. And if we only focus on scenarios where it would have a very limited benefit, then this is not worth billions of dollars of investment. So we have to go for the moonshot. We have to go for the decisions that are biased and try to replace them with a more fair decision. I was gonna push back on Tiana's statement that, oh, a doctor would not look at the age. Like the algorithm just reflected what the doctors are doing. If age is used, is, is identified as a predictor, then it means that doctors are also looking at the age. So it, it, AI is not producing something that we're not doing. It's, it's merely a mirror of what's happening in the world now. Um, and I wanted to um, remind people, for example, treatment injuries and medical errors. One in three people will have had a misdiagnosis or a mistreatment. But that risk is not the same for every one of us. We know that some people are at highest risk, at higher risk of medical errors. This is not like, because people have likened healthcare industry to aviation, that we need to adopt the safety practices of the aviation industry. But the aviation industry is different. If the plane crashes, everyone dies. In healthcare, when the system fails, we know who's going to die. We know it's not going to be everyone. Well, I wanted to rephrase the aviation industry because you know that some people have parachutes if that plane crashed. And a lot of people won't have parachute and will, will perish. So to me, we need to carry on, but we just need to be more thoughtful and creative in how to leverage this technology because we need it as i said we cannot stop we actually need to work faster Bef before i would tell the audience we need to slow down because we're building the plane as we fly it and if we crash we're going to be dead for sure but now what i'm saying is we need to work faster we need to overtake the industry ai peddlers because they're pushing ai into our faces and we don't understand yet all the risks and all the dangers that this could mean for us. So somehow we need to do more in terms of educating everyone of where are the opportunities and limitations of AI, uh, because otherwise all the billion dollar investment would be a bust. Absolutely. So you've, you bring up something there about the kind of different players in this process. 
So the different people who are bringing different perspectives and different goals to the, the process of developing and, and deploying and using and evaluating AI. And I wanted, to, I wanted to bring that question forward of who are the people who are involved in this right now? Who's not, a, who's not being involved in it? And also, who can we start to hold accountable? Like, where does accountability sit when we think about the people who are working with AI systems? Obviously, this is a complex legal question, but it's, it's a complex moral question as well. And I want to take that to all the members of the panel to get your thoughts on where do we start to, to, to bring accountability into practice in bringing these observations about bias, observations about inequity into action that we can start to take. Lex, I know this is something that you've thought, uh, that you've thought quite a bit about and, and had a lot of discussions around, so I'd, I'd love to start with you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Leo, as you were saying, I'm coming to ask you this question because you mentioned about, you talked about in the example of the doctor, a doctor could misdiagnose someone and if that has harmful repercussions, there is, I think, I would like to believe there's a process where the doctor could be held accountable for that particular misdiagnosis, you know, or, you know, or, you know, prescription or particular stuff. And I guess my question to you and to everyone here, actually, um, um, I whispered into Danny's ear when you were talking about this. So I was like, what, who do we hold accountable? You know, I think that's one of the things. I think the reason, as a, coming from a developer perspective, we're using these models, I guess I'm trying to limit the scope so that the risk of harm means that I can reduce the amount of liability that I have or the risk or the pop being in that situation where you're being... Who, who, yeah, I think for me, it's like, who gets held accountable for these... If you use these models in those high-risk environments, what happens if something goes wrong? Who do we hold to account for these particular things? Is that the company? Did the comp does the company deflect on the, you know, what that, and yeah, I guess it's, it's more from a moral perspective maybe than a legal perspective, but I'm just interested in getting your thoughts there as well about that, because it's something I'm really interested in as a topic of conversation as well, accountability. Leo, do you want to do you want to speak to that and then take to your response? Yes, as well? no. Uh, I mean, when you were asking, what are some concrete steps that we can take so that we write the course, uh, we 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 chart it in the in the in the right direction? And to me, the answer is definitely guardrails, regulation, um, and it and people always push back when you say we need more regulations. They always say, oh, regulations will stifle innovation. And the next question there is, what is the, what is the goal of innovation? If the goal of innovation is to make lives better for those who are already uh, privileged, then of course it will stifle it. But if your goal is health equity, then clearly the regulations are probably gonna help in terms of pushing your innovations in the right direction. Um, some of the ideas that we have been bouncing around and we've been pushing up front when it comes to regulation would be truly pushing transparency at the forefront. Like there has to be transparency. And I think transparency is linked with accountability. When you're open about uh, what process did you use to collect the data, uh, what is the curation and analytics pipeline to build the models, and what are the mechanisms for evaluating and deploying the models? I think that it may not completely solve the problem, but we're definitely heading the right direction. So um, we have been advocating to, for example, add a team. So I'm not sure if people have heard, but the EU AI Act is pushing for transparency in the data set, transparency in the uh, model development and what we're, promoting is transparency on who are the people behind this particular model. So there's the data card, the model card, and the team card that should accompany any model that is uh, deployed. So we want to know specifically what data or where did the data come from, which people's uh, data were used to train the model. We want to know how the, was the model pre-processed, curated, harmonized, and analyzed. And then we want to know what's the composition of the team. Are there patients 
uh, and patient advocates who were part of the co-design uh, thinking process. Um, we think that this is going to be an important step for us to truly uh, leverage uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and then we're also pushing for regulation around the use of data. In the United States, it's quite complex where there is a delineation between wellness data and health data. Those are two separate types of data. So there's not a lot of regulation for wellness data. And then there's also this delineation between de-identified data and data with uh, personal health information. So unfortunately here in the United States, once a database is de-identified, the patients no longer have any say of what that data uh, could be used for. Uh, that's why companies are selling them after they're de-identified. Um, and we, we think that that needs to change. A lot of the laws are very outdated. So in the United States, we have HIPAA laws and they were put together in the 1990s when we did not have big data, when we did not have artificial intelligence. It's time to re-examine whether these laws are still relevant in this age of uh, artificial intelligence. So what we're pushing for now is there has to be complete transparency on who is selling our data and what are they doing with our data. Uh -huh. Legal wise, there's probably not going to be a lot of support for this because they're going to say that this will uh, impede on corporate competitive advantage, that that's where their uh, secret sauce is. So they cannot divulge these processes. But to me, we need to weigh the, the benefits of, uh, of corporate competitive advantage versus public health safety, population health. Uh, but there needs to be a lot of rethinking about guardrails and, and incentive structures too. So the question that keeps bugging me now is, can we, can, can we get value from AI without fixing the world? Because mm. I think it's a big ask to think that AI. Oh, oh. we may have lost it. Well, while, while Leo is coming back, um, I do want to, Tarana, I, I do want to get your thoughts on this. Well, hopefully we'll have Leo back. Uh, Tarana, I do want to get your thoughts on this. Lex, did you, was there something you'd wanted to react to in, in what Leo was saying? I think it was going to go, he, he began to mention it about, when he talked about that open transparency, it was like, okay, then that means just the commercial models in terms of how we, these, the, business models, I guess, mm -hmm. would that need to change? Would it, and I was gonna then ask Tiana, like, you know, open source, I, I, I actually asked the audience as well, that the debate over an open source model versus, you know, uh, off the shelf model and those particular things and go into that um, kind of conversation there. Cause I guess, I guess I'm, I'm, a lot of the times I'm coming from that developer perspective where, you know, I'm thinking of, okay, you know, if I want a transparent model, then I need to work with an open source model where, you know, really and truly you can see the code, you can see the process, you can understand everything that is da there. But then also there's always this the challenge of, okay, you take on an open source model, you embed that into a product, you have to spend more time maintaining it. So I think it was, it was more those type yeah. of things, but Leo's back as well. So, but yeah. so yes, well, we're very, very glad to have you back, Leo. But I, so I, I want to pick up on that then because Charna, you know, you being, in the research setting, really embedded with working with a lot of these models at, at a very, at, you know, at a very technical and a very data-driven level, these questions of transparency and accountability, some of these questions around open science, they really do interact with one another. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on what sort of more open and more transparent practices bring to the table in addressing some of these questions about bias and equity in the work that we're doing. Yeah, so I think always the best way to check if something's right or wrong is to be able to access it. You need to be able to access someone's data set. You need to be able to access their model. You need to be able to access their methods. Um, and that's not always something that people do because, um, for example, if you take open AI, um, GPT-4 is actually, well, last time I checked, it's not publicly available. They didn't release what they trained it on which means that when you get these biased results that um, Leia was talking about earlier, where do they come from? No one knows because they haven't made their, their things available. Um, and I think one of the other things that Leo mentioned is, well, this data, 
where is it going? Um, and I was actually reading earlier today that uh, I don't know if any of you unfortunately went to a hospital during COVID because all of that data that the NHS took, they want to sell that to third party companies. Um, one of whom being, uh, I don't know if you know, the company Palantir, which I'm not going to go on a rant about, but they are the shadiest American company you can imagine, which is quite a challenge. Um, but yeah, they want to sell it, which, you know, it makes sense. They'll get about 500 million pounds, which is a lot of money. It'll fund, you know, a lot of the NHS. But no one really had the opportunity to opt out of it. The last date to opt out was the 23rd of June, 2021. It's been and gone. So your data, no one really knows where it is. Well, I'm sure the people who sold it do, but you don't. Um, and I think this is one of the issues is that you can't really hold people accountable if you can't trust them and you don't know what they're actually doing with your data and what they're doing with these models and what the models actually are. Because quite a lot of the time, you know what they do, but you don't know what they are. Um, and I think, what was the question you asked me, Lex? <laughs> Sorry, I've just been ranting. Think, thinking about open science practices as yeah. part of it. Yeah, yeah. So, this is where my researcher hat comes on because that was my opinion personally. As a researcher, I do somewhat understand the want to keep things under wraps because you can be, from, from the view of a PhD student, your project is like your baby. You're working on it and you don't want someone to steal it. However, that does not help the scientific community. That does not help medicine, that doesn't help patients. Uh, if people don't know what you're doing and how you've done it and like kind of what you've done, um, it, it just doesn't help anyone. So I think transparency is the way to go. Um, I think the field of research has a long way to go with this. So I know a lot of um, journals, a lot of publications, they will ask you that if your paper is to be accepted, you have to Tell us where your data came from. You have to make your code available. You have to make all of this transparent. But um, there was a paper a couple of years ago that looked at a load of um, dermatology studies, and they found that not only did the papers not report where their data had come from, even when they asked the authors, they couldn't identify where all their data had come from, which is just ridiculous because they didn't even know if their patients overlapped, if like how much different studies contributed to different data sets. It was a mess. Um, so I think, in general, yes, I would say more transparency everywhere in every part of AI. Um, who's responsible for that? I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I would say researchers in general, um, but last thing I'll add, um, is that the EU has a really great commission that's working on AI sort of regulations. I won't talk about 2016 politics, but as we know, we're not part of that little group anymore. Um, but the UK is working on their own sort of AI regulations, especially when it comes to the NHS. They have a lot of working groups. Um, the one thing I will say is that a lot of private companies, um, to kind of be implemented in the NHS, you have to go for a CE mark. A lot of companies are just kind of not doing that. Um, they've just said, we don't want to go for the CE mark. Our algorithms are admin. We don't have to do it. And in a survey, half of them said, the government wrote a code of conduct. They said, we don't even know what this code of conduct is. So the regulations are there, whether or not companies are following them. And even as I mentioned before, the NHS is selling our data. They're not even kind of following their own regulations. So you can lead a horse to water. You can't make it drink. Who is responsible? I would say personally, researchers individually, but kind of, as we've seen, governments don't always do the right thing. So I think it's up to the, us, the people, to campaign for it. It's my long answer. Brilliant. So I do want to make sure that we have some time to get to your questions. There's been some really great uh, discussion going on online already. But before we do that, I want to, and, and Leo, we know that you may need to drop off fairly soon because Leo actually is responsible for taking care of people's health. Um, so <laughs> we don't want to keep him from that. But before you go, I do want to ask one more question to the panel um, before we get to your questions, which is imagine that these things that we've been talking about happen and things are better. Imagine that we, we can, in fact, get the horse to drink when we bring it to water. Lex, I want to come back to the, the question that you asked at the beginning. Why are we doing this? 
if we had more equitable, more fair AI, what kinds of things could we imagine it doing in healthcare? What is the goal that we are trying to work towards? And Leo, I want to go to you first on this, as, as I know you may need to drop off. Yeah, no, I want AI that would tell me if I'm making a biased decision. Um, and I, I, I have a story, but I think it's too long to, to narrate it now. But to me, that would be a goalpost. That would be the moonshot. Can we come up with a system that will automatically uh, identify, tag decisions like, hey, will you be making the same decision if this were, if your patient is not a prisoner? <laughs> And, uh, and, and and your patient is a lovely grandmother surrounded by, her, by kids. Because we make these decisions all the time and people don't realize how much they're colored by how we see the patient, how we listen to their accent. And, and to me, AI could be the great equalizer. So setting aside everything else for a generic patient, this is likely the best decision that you could make. And that will be a hard system to design, but I think it's doable. Um, I think we're smart enough to be able to uh, repackage AI so that it will do that exactly. And it will reduce the medical errors and treatment injuries, especially those to those who are most vulnerable. And it will deliver equitable benefit of all the healthcare innovations that we have, including AI. But I'm gonna drop off. It's been an, an amazing discussion. I'd love to carry on, but I, I need to go. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Leo. <laughs> Tiana, I wanna then bring that over to you. So thinking about, imagine that the issues that you're studying go away. <laughs> not, not that we want you to not have you know, work to do anymore, but what do, what do we want to be working towards? So we've heard one vision from, from Leo. Uh, how would you add, to, what, what kind of other areas would you see AI really making a difference in improving that patient care, improving the patient experience in this, the various problems that we have in the healthcare system at the moment? I think, firstly, I would like these problems to be solved, but maybe after I get my PhD, so I have something to write about. I don't, um, don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, I think we're moving generally towards personalized medicine where kind of everything you approach a doctor with is, is personalized. So your, the doses of, of your medication is personalized and all your records are personalized on an app and everything is personalized to you. The problem with this is that in an effort to make everything so personalized, we're adding so much data and so much data that actually what happens is it doesn't work so well for individual people and that we try to make it work for groups of people, but for an individual, somehow it doesn't work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I think kind of the sort of thing that Lex has been saying, like roll it back a little bit, let's go back to simplicity and work out where exactly we want this automation and where exactly we want these models because it, it doesn't have to be a model for everything. You don't have to have a model to answer the phone and a model to book an appointment and a model to diagnose the patient and a model. It, it doesn't need to be that way. And I think it does lead to something called automation bias where a clinician puts too much trust in the model. Uh, so they'll believe anything it says. And when these things do go wrong, who do, you, who do you turn to? Who's responsible for that? So I think a bit more simplicity and more of a view of the patient in mind. Mm -hmm. Who is the, I was going to say end product, but that's not maybe the best phrase, but who is the end user? The end user is the patient. It's not the researcher. It's not even really the doctor. It's the patient. And we should be looking to make things as good as we can for the patient. Right. Thank you. Lex, let me turn your, your own question back to you. It's a bit, a bit unfair of me, but uh, imagine that we do have more, more equitable, more uh, patient-focused AI where do you, why would you use it? Where, where do you see oppor real opportunities to make a real difference with the kind of technological affordances that AI systems can offer? Um, I guess at the end of the day, when I think of a lot of the work, when we you know, do a lot of design research, user research with, with patients, you know, their biggest desires, they don't really want to use an, an interface. They want that human to human connection. I think a lot of the times how we design stuff from a technology standpoint, is we design almost things to take us away from human connection, take us away from nature. You've got this 
massive VR headsets that you have to wear that's, you know what I mean? So I think my dream would be that trust are in the, if we if all of these things are solved, there is trust in these systems which will free up clinicians times in order to have this face to face interactions with their patients. If I'm building tools which make clinicians do more work, then I've failed. So that the first thing first is really to free up their time so that there's more space for yeah, face to face interactions. I guess the second thing, right, is if machine learning is comfortable with dealing with uncertainty. Because I think machine learning, you know, the algorithm constantly makes a prediction. And healthcare is a, is a world where sometimes it's hard to predict, right? So could it deal with uncertainty really well? I guess that comes up to that first point. But having trust in those systems to free up time for clinicians and patients to interact with each other is, yeah, it's the dream. Right, thank you very much. So we do have a little bit of time. Uh, apologies, we, can, we could just, as you can see, we could just keep going on about this for, for days. Um, we do have some time uh, to get questions from you. There is, so there are a couple of roving mics that can come around, so if you do have a question, please just raise your hand. Uh, we do have one question from an online, uh, an online attendee who's been waiting very patiently for us to get to an excellent question, so I do want to bring this up. And they asked, do you think that if AI was developed in an unbiased way, and this kind of follows on from what we were just talking about, do you think that an unbiased AI might then be more fair than humans? Tiarna, I want to take this to you first, not to put you on the spot at all, but because this, this aligns with the kind of questions of, of measurement of fairness. Um, I would say it depends on how you measure both fairness and bias. For example, if you have, for example, uh, a model that's deciding loans, you wouldn't want the, the model to use someone's race, for example, as a factor when deciding loans. People of different races should get the same loans. It, it shouldn't be uh, like dependent on someone's race. However, when you're looking at healthcare, someone's race might actually be important information, so, uh, or someone's age, or someone's sex. So those are two different scenarios where you might use two different definitions of, of kind of fairness and bias, and what is fair, and what do you want to kind of achieve. So an unbiased model might be more, I'll put it this way, an unbiased model, kind of by definition, would be less biased than a human. But one thing I'll say is that bias isn't always bad. For example, if I've broken my leg and these two haven't, there is no point giving all three of us a cast just in the name of being equitable if I'm the only person who has the need for the cast. Sometimes, especially in healthcare, different levels of need require different levels of resources. So there is sometimes a need for bias. I think what we've been discussing here is kind of unwanted and kind of unresolved bias. Um, so I'd say an unbiased model in the sense of the unwanted bias that we've been talking about would be good. Can we achieve it? I highly doubt it. Right now. Lex, did you want to add to that? I think the thing you have to think about when we talk about that concept of fair is we've got to talk about cultural perspectives. I think that's a really, really big, big, big thing. Like, culturally, there is a different opinion on fairness. And that could be based on your religion, based on where you live. Like, there's so much factors that fairness <coughs> is a subjective thing. So I kind of say fairness can only work in that particular context, but it's so subjective that it's probably very impossible to achieve because of the subjectivity of the term fairness. There is things where coming, you know, I come from a Nigerian heritage that fairness might be seen quite different to maybe, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit, it's so broad that it's so hard. I think one thing I will say is that I don't think it's a one, I don't think it's a one model solves all situation. I think there has to be this conversation about having smaller models. I don't think we need to spend, I think that will be the evolution of AI development would be these smaller language models or smaller models which would be more you know, in terms of how we navigate stuff, but I don't think it's the one size fit all just because, you know, it's so hard. Basically, dude, this is basically the Tower of Babel, if anybody's followed biblical stories in the past and seen how that, yeah, it wasn't possible to create. 
and it will be a similar thing here. Yeah, and I, I definitely want to echo what you said about sort of thinking about multiplicity from a modeling perspective and not to, uh, to reflect the kind of multiplicity of how we live, that approaching this from a perspective of we want one model that will be perfect, that will be unbiased, that will do everything is very difficult. It's not especially achievable. And to my mind, it's kind of counterproductive, which I think aligns somewhat with, with uh, what you were saying, Lex, that I think there's much more to be gained from much more focused application of AI and situations where you can say, in this situation, what does fairness look like in a much more clearly defined way? Did we have a question in the audience? I thought that I'd seen a hand. There's a hand over here. Okay. Okay, I can just. Hello. Uh, my name is Nurus. I came from Malaysia. That's 14 hours by flight. Um, so I came here to. Uh, interview respondents for my PhD research, which is AI regulations in healthcare. Now, I'm very interested in biasness and transparency and what Leo said, like putting, pushing transparency to the front. But uh, I've been listening to the panels discussing on how to make AI, how to de-bias AI from the technical perspectives. Now, this is a very tricky um, pathway uh, that we are threading especially in terms of uh, legislative perspective, like translating technical technicalities into something that is meaningful for laymen or users are very much uh, challenging. Like, for example, if I go for a surgery, right, um, and I want to know what kind of treatment that I'm, I'm putting for, and then uh, there's the issue of how much information that the physicians ought to give me, right? So, so that the entire process would be transparent. But uh, speaking from a very uh, logical perspective is that I don't need much, like I don't need to understand the technicalities of the system, how does it work? I just need to know that what kind of treatment am I getting? And most probably I would just listen to my doctors. So how do we bridge this different of perspectives from the technical uh, uh, technicalities of AI and also like the people, like my people, <laughs> the legal ones? It's very hard and, uh, and challenging, especially when you are talking about, I think I've heard uh, and read about explainable AI. Uh, there's so much debate going on. But again, translating explainable AI into the legal perspective is uh, I would rather not go there yet because it's just like um, a duck talking to a, to a chicken, like we don't understand at all. So yeah, I mean, um, one of the uh, suggestions given by, res uh, by my respondents here in the UK is to explore on the feasibility of making explainable AI legally operative. So it's, you can imagine how hard it is, like understanding it from the technical perspective is hard enough. What more to translate it to uh, become something that we can embed in the regulation. So how do we bridge this? How do we come to a equilibrium where uh, law or regulations and um, technical understanding of AI can coexist? Thank you for that question. That, 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 is a, that is a really, really good question. You touched on a lot of, a lot of important issues. Um, you should stick around and, and speak at the AI Safety Summit because I think they could use, they could use the, the issues you're raising. You know, it, these, this question of the sort of two issues of um, making explainability and transparency legally operative, that is its own very particular can of worms. Um, and if, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to set that one aside because frankly, we're not really the right people to speak to that. I do want to, to get to the, the question about the sort of balance of transparency. There's so much information that goes into this. There's so much that you could, in theory, make visible. And navigating this balance of what needs to be visible to whom, what is actually useful to make visible, is a really, really important question for us to be asking as part of these kind of transparency and openness discussions. So I want to take that back to Lex and Tiana. Do either of you have immediate thoughts on that in terms of how we go about striking that balance or perhaps making 
creating the sorts of frameworks and structures in which we can change that balance on the fly. I, th I think for me, when it comes to, it, it kind of goes back to the example when I talked about this project of Mudra, when we were trying to create this sort of explainable algorithms, algorithm explains this process. But one of the key things from a design perspective or interaction design perspective is we don't want to burden the patient with information. They're already burdened already. So you just, you know, where transparency really comes in is when things goes wrong. That's where, like, that's where the real problems happen is where things go wrong, how can we be able to assess the system to identify that? But if things are fairly moving straight forward, then you don't really have much to worry about. But it's always designing for just in case. I think that's the way. I think sometimes when we does when we approach design and even that conversation of design thinking, we always frame it from this positive standpoint that you know we always have, okay, we designed this app or this solution and everything's gonna work well and woohoo, well done. But we sometimes in that design thinking process don't spend a lot of time to think about either who are the bad actors of these particular systems or what are the particular unintended consequences that would necessarily happen and how do we mitigate for those things. So I think it's about you know, when things go wrong, what is the system that is designed for that? And what is all of those different systems that come together? But on a normal day-to-day -day process, people don't need to be burdened with this concept of transparency. I think it's, you know, like Leo said, it's just, a, you know, it's improving health outcomes. But when those outcomes all went, yeah, that's, that's how I see it from, from my perspective. Um. I would say, I, I guess, in just the example you gave about being able to talk to your surgeon, I think that really is the difference, is that, so I'm the sort of person that when I get something new, I read all the manuals, just because I like to know that information. And if I was seeing my doctor, I could ask, but I think that's the difference. You have the opportunity to ask. And with these models, you can't interact with them in the same way, unless it's like a large language model and you have a chatbot. But most mm -hmm. of these things, they just kind of spit out an answer. And you don't know where that answer's come from. They are literally called black boxes for this reason. Um, so I think, as you say, explainable AI, which is kind of providing some sort of explanation as to why a certain prediction or classification, whatever it is, has been produced. Um, I think that's the way to go because, especially in medicine, um, if you know your models spat out this diagnosis, especially as Lex says, when it disagrees with the equation or when things go wrong, you want to know where that's come from. And at the moment, I don't think we have that transparency to know where where this magical thing has dropped out from. Um, so, yeah, I would say that's the main difference. And then the other challenge is I don't think the model even knows when it goes wrong because it doesn't have that context, right? And I use an example of Midjourney. So with Midjourney, you could give it an image and Midjourney has this feature. For those who don't know Midjourney, Midjourney is an image creator, generator that you can just pad by machine learning models. You could feed an image to Midjourney and use this feature called Describe, and it would make a description of this feature. Then you would ask Midjourney. Midjourney gives you the option after it's described this image to basically, based on the prompts it's, it's described it with, to generate this image, and it doesn't generate the same image. Not even, most times, not close enough. So there's also that challenge as well, right? The model has no context so, or understanding, so how do you necessarily... That goes back to you know, either the developer, I, I, you know, you might, I might need your help here on this, but like, there's still another step beforehand when you have to think about when the model has no context, or no, how do you even know how the model went wrong? Like, how, how does that even get presented from a, you know, to tell a story in that case? Absolutely, and I, th I think that, that is a really important question, the sort of, the, eval the, the evaluation issue more broadly, and certainly the idea of telling wh when does it go wrong. So we, we've had a lot of really excellent questions from the online audience. I'm sure that, that uh, there are more questions to be had here. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to get to all of them. There is one that I do really want to bring out because it touches on um, a theme that we've been talking around but not really had a chance to talk about. And so there, there was, this, will, this will be the last question that we'll take. Um, so the question was, training AI requires data, but as we've said, the voices that aren't here are some of the most important to keep in mind. So what are some of the approaches that we can take to get the data that we simply may not have? I will take a first crack at this. So for, for me, coming from the 
uh, disability and AI perspective and, and uh, starting to work increasingly in contexts of not just disability equity, but moving towards, uh, moving from equity towards justice. Talking about co-design, talking about you know, participatory design, lots, lots of different models that we can talk about here, but co-design where we say the voices that are currently doing this right now are not sufficient. So co-design as a necessity, not as a value add. That if you are not getting the voices in the room that are, that are going to be most affected by the thing that you're doing, you're not doing it right. And you shouldn't be doing it. That to me is, is the sort of justice-oriented way of thinking about how we get towards that kind of data that we may not have, is we say, if we don't have it, we're not doing it well enough. So I'll take that then to Lex and Tiara for, for your uh, thoughts to add to that. Do you want to go first? I guess, yeah, I guess it goes back to that aspect of slowing down things, right? It's, it's kind of what I said uh, a long while ago, is like minimizing the scope of where we put these models in these sort of uncontrolled environments, because I think you still have to take a step to slow down and learn, whereas that's the antithesis of tech sometimes, because we build this aspect to move fast and break things, and you say sorry after, you've hurt everybody. That's how tech is normally done. And I think there needs to be, to now say, you know, if you, if you think of it, if you're tr trying to access data, the internet is, I call it the repository of evil, but it's one of the fastest way to gather a large amount of data at once. And then you have to go through the process where you, you know, clean the data, label it, and that's also another ethical implication that we can talk about in another panel. But you have to be willing to take the slower approach where those people who are not captured, you know, they're not on the internet or they don't have their data out there, they're not in these places, you, you gotta go and meet them, meet in front of them. But it's a much more slower process. Mm -hmm. And we need to be okay with that and change our approach to innovation, which sometimes is very much like all about pace, about speed, and about having a much more slower approach to things is something that I think is, is, is I would encourage that. And it's something I'm even, you know, trying to take with doing a lot of work in healthcare is a much more slower approach, more responsible approach, more limited approach, so that you can slow down, learn, observe, identify whose voices are not being heard, reach out, connect, and constantly have that process. You know, because this is, we're still at the early stages. And AI has been, you know, machine learning is a concept that's been here since 1950-something in the summer, that my proposal when a bunch of mathematicians and scientists wanted to get funding to look at, art, you know, the term artificial intelligence. So even though 50, 60 years, we're still at this point, and it's still a long time to go. So that's something as well to also encourage, but I think it's that aspect of that slowness and not engaging in innovation for innovation's sake. Um, I would say from, from my work, looking at literally unbalanced data sets, one of the biggest problems is that all the data sets, well, most of the data sets we have are from the global west and the northern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. um, so overwhelmingly, they're gonna be kind of white and male, um, and if we do want people from kind of other backgrounds, what tends to happen is that companies, researchers will go to Global South and say, oh, please, can we have your data? And then people will give them the data and then they'll run back to their countries and then use the models that they've trained like in their populations and do absolutely nothing to help people in the countries where they've got the data. Um, so I think one of the biggest issues is one, kind of researchers having, well, not researchers, researchers and institutions, having the motivation to go and get this data um, from like countries where people are underrepresented, but also not just steal their data, but to also develop models that can be used and implemented in these countries. Because one of the things that um, kind of people are theorizing is that when these models kind of get to their sort of quote unquote perfect state is that they're gonna be used in the countries that benefit the most. And that all this data that we've kind of stolen from um, you know, underdeveloped countries, they're not gonna get a look in. Um, so that's one of the other things to do. And I'd say, for me, so in my experience, um, I think I have seen a lot of problems that other people that I've worked with 
haven't seen um, when we're looking at data sets and, and just data in general, and it's because it doesn't always apply to them. So I think kind of what you were saying, Denny, is that you need people who are different to be around the table to be able to point out when things are wrong and say, hey, from my background, I know this isn't quite right, or hey, like you're saying with different definitions of fairness, you need people from different backgrounds to be able to add their input. Um, so I think really starting at like grassroots levels, get into schools, get into high schools, get into unis, teach people about fairness and bias and diversity, not just in machine learning or deep learning or AI, but all different fields, because the other thing scientists aren't good at is communicating. So we need people from other fields to come in and tell us about ethics and, hey, I'm from geography and I know that from this aspect, this will be useful here. Um, so really starting at a base level and getting more people from different backgrounds into the field and being able to add their input because um, at the moment the table tends to look very homogenous. Thank you very much. And we are going to have to wrap up with that. Thank you so much for all of your engagement. Thank you for all of the amazing questions online. You have your marching orders. Take the discussions that we've had here Keep, bring them out into the world. Talk about these things with other people. Keep discussions going. Feel free to contact us. Feel free to continue this discussion. This is something that is not, this is not one panel discussion. This is an ongoing thing. Uh, and please join me in thanking our fantastic panel. Can we clap for ourselves? Can we clap for ourselves? <laughs> and thank you for joining us. <laughs>